Surf Chat. This is episode 27, um, and I think they probably missed the first five seconds of that. But episode 27, we're going to be talking about bicarbonates and their importance, or as Michael Wood says, their unimportance in irrigation water. And so, as we always do, I want to start by going around the room left to right. We've got a packed house in here, um, and we'll allow you to do introductions, say who you are, where you're from, and we'll move on. All right, we'll start with you, Bill. All right, good morning, everyone. Bill Brown from Turf Republic in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Uh, excited to be a part of this. Um, encourage everybody to check out Turf Republic if you get a chance. Guys, looking forward to this talk. When I was a superintendent at one of my golf courses, we had uh, real bad bicarbonate issues, or at least uh, it seemed to be. So <laughs> looking forward to hear what everybody has to say. Bruce, you're up. Good morning, Bruce Williams out in Los Angeles. Uh, I too have had bicarbonate issues at golf courses I've managed, so uh, always looking to glean some expertise from people like the professors and also uh, good friend Mike Huck that's as knowledgeable in this arena as anybody I know. So looking forward to getting some good information. Don't wait for me, guys. Just as soon as the next going, then oh. just go left to right. So, uh, Doug. It's me. Okay. Hey, I'm Doug Soldat from University of Wisconsin, uh, and I'm with gra my graduate student, Glenn O'Bear, here, who is uh, doing a, he's probably on a second or third year of researching bicarbonates. In Wisconsin, in the upper Midwest, we have ridiculously high uh, bicarbonate in our irrigation water, but no sodium. So it's kind of a unique situation, that, and we're interested in, in uh, bicarbonate chemistry. I'm Joey Young. I'm the turf professor at Texas Tech in Lubbock, and uh, we have really terrible water quality here for sure. So I've only been here about three months, so I don't know a whole lot about what else going on yet. But uh, looking to learn some stuff, maybe research opportunities in the future. So I'm uh, Josh Yikye. I'm the lab supervisor here at Aquatrols in uh, Paulsboro, New Jersey, um, and I'm here to uh, listen in on Mike's uh, talk on bicarbonate and uh, see. Um, you know, what information might be useful for us as well in, um, in adding to our uh, guide to assessing uh, soil and water quality issues. This is Larry Stoll from Pace Turf, and uh, I'll be talking in a minute. No sound. Yeah, You're muted, uh, Matt. Sorry, I'm working on a tape loop. I think I'm the only one here and ever there twice. Uh, uh, yeah. Matt Crowther, Mink Meadows Golf Club. Sorry, I don't I have a bicarbonate much issue as much as a salt water intrusion. Hey, um, hey, Matt, you got to uh, shut that feed off. Okay, shut, shut the loop off and then just uh, talk live. We'll come back to Matt. Micah, go ahead. I'm Mike Woods. I'm the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. Hi. And I'm Mike Huck, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit later. Uh, I do irrigation water quality consulting in Southern California, Orange County. I'm based out of. Okay, uh, and I'm John Kaminsky. I'm an associate professor at Penn State and run these uh, turf chats. We're up to episode 27, and uh, we have some good plans for some future ones coming up, including a discussion with uh, Joey Young, who's in the Hangout. So. Today, um, Matt, did you have uh, your sound back? Yeah, all good? Yeah, good. So all introduce right. yourself. Uh, Matt Crowther, Mink Meadows Golf Club, Martha's Vineyard. I don't really have a bicarbonate issue, um, although you guys will tell me that today. It's been mostly a sodium issue. I have saltwater intrusion in my irrigation well. Okay. Um, well, I think that, uh, I don't know where this topic started, Larry, you probably know um, how this kind of got going in MICA, but it seemed to generate a lot of interest from people uh, discussing the um, issue as it relates to bicarbonates. It's a big one in Pennsylvania because uh, there's, I think, some either misinformation or miscommunication. I'm not an expert by any means on bicarbonates and an irrigation water quality, but um, I think that it's going to be good. I'm going to learn a lot. So I'm going to turn it over to Larry. Larry, go ahead and uh, you're up. Everybody, if I could just remind you a couple things before Larry starts. One, mute yourself and don't forget to unmute yourself if you have a question. 
And to anybody listening on Twitter or out there in cyberspace or watching live, you can join in the conversation as well, even though you're not in the room. Just be sure to uh, tweet out with the hashtag TurfChat, and when I see those come through, I'll ask any questions that you might have out in the field. So this is a good way for you to get some answers, uh, questions answered as well. All right, Larry, you're up. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, bicarbonate and irrigation water and why you should not be concerned. So there's going to be some issues that we're going to go over that uh, we'll describe uh, why there's uh, confusion about bicarbonate and uh, and some of the levels. And we did some a uh, little bit of data analysis on uh, some information we've had in the uh, PACE database for a while to uh, sort of explain uh, why the confusion comes up and and um, see if we can get clear it up just a little bit. See if I can get this thing to go forward. So the reasons that we've uh, pretty much been told to worry is that uh, there's plugging pores, soil pores, but there's really, uh, we haven't seen any data in turf systems anyway, and, and, and a lot of this data comes from agricultural systems and furrow irrigation and sprinkler irrigation, uh, where you're actually uh, having water impact the soil directly. You don't have uh, turf or any roots uh, around the top, so it's a, a little different. We haven't seen the data in turf. Uh, there might be some out there. We'd like to see it if there is some. On, uh, on an actual turf system where uh, hydraulic conductivity goes down with uh, some plugging that's a result of uh, some acid uh, issues, I mean some uh, carbonate issues. And then tying up nutrients, and we still haven't seen the data there, and if, as you know, the, many of you probably know that Micah Woods and I have been working on minimum levels for sustainable nutrition, and it looks like we really don't need some of the high levels that we had thought we were needing in the past. So uh, it's really, if it ties up some nutrients, it's, it's probably I'm not sure if it's a problem at all. So what we're looking at, and uh, in, uh, Mike Huck and I talked quite a bit yesterday, and we're trying to figure out how we can get this uh, into some sort of a framework where we can get some nice, simple guidelines for people to use to give an idea of what's going on. And the easiest one, if your water pH is below 6.8, just don't worry about it at all. Uh, it's not going to be a problem. If your pH is above 8, then there's some concerns you might have, but then that's going to depend on some other factors in the water. If you have a really pure water, then uh, that that pH doesn't really mean much. But if you have a high salt content water, well, then it's, it may be an issue. But it depends on the rest of the salts that are in there because bicarbonates are less an issue uh, in high salt waters than they are in, in, in low salt waters. Uh, and then if the EC is less than 0.5 uh, in the water, so it's like 320 parts per million, and bicarbonates are more than 50% of the anions, then you might have a problem. That's going to be relating to uh, SAR and is... Uh, uh, Dr. Soldat men mentioned if, if you don't have uh, sodium around, then you're probably uh, not going to uh, have a problem. So here's a, here's the sort of the, the, the targets that we're kind of looking for is if your soil sodium absorption ratio is less than 6, using a patch, saturated paste extract, or if you're, or if you're less than 6 uh, with a standard uh, Melic 3 extraction, you're probably not going to have a problem. And we're also going to be talking about non-saline soils. If you've got a saline soil problem, that's a whole different issue uh, that you have to look at in a, just a little bit different way, and it's not just a bicarbonate issue. There may be some structural problems with the soils or something else, that, uh, or irrigation methods, or the water quality is just too high salt to, to manage. Uh, if the pH is stable and not increasing above 8, then you probably don't have a problem. So really, diagnosing these things, we want you to look at your soil pHs over time, and if your pH isn't creeping up, then uh, probably you don't need to worry about it. And if sodium parts per million aren't increasing, then you probably don't have to worry about it either. And if the soil EC is less than the tolerance of the turf species, then you're, you're probably in good shape. So in, it's not just the single data point that you take in one time that you're sampling the soils. You should have a trend of these, uh, these factors over time to see if your soils are moving toward or away from a, a, a good condition. So good water guidelines, and this is these are really pretty good waters, is that the bicarbonates are less than 92 parts per million or 1.5 milliequivalents per liter, you're probably not going to have a problem. If the residual sodium carbonate is less than uh, 1.25 milliequivalents per liter, probably not a problem. If the adjusted SAR is less than 6, you're still probably okay. And if the EC is higher than 0.5 and less than 1.2, you probably don't have a problem. So there are some guidelines uh, for waters that are probably not going to cause an issue. That doesn't mean that they're going to work on your soils because if you have some sort of a clay soil that doesn't drain or if you have any kind of a drainage problem, it doesn't matter what your water quality is because it's just not going to work. So there's a lot of factors involved in these. Uh, so what I want to show you now, this is a, uh, it's hard to see what the dates are in there, but these uh, graphs are from a couple of locations. One was what we call a good water and one a problem water. 
and we're looking at about uh, 10 years, well, it's from 97 to 2013, uh, sodium, uh, just a sodium hazard uh, on the first upper left graph. And you can see it's running between one and, uh, say, two and a half, mostly around one and a quarter, something like that. Larry, I, I don't know if everybody else is, but I'm a slide or two behind on the screen. Okay. Is that right? Where is everybody? I, I, see, I, see, a, I screen, see a screen that says good water, and you've got four figures up there. Yeah, I'm right with you, Larry. Yep. Mike, are you watching this live, or are you watching it in the Hangout itself? I'm watching it in the Hangout itself. And you're behind? Yeah. Well, we uh -oh. might just have to have you catch up. I think, is everybody else Is everybody else on that good water well, slide? It, it doesn't matter to me. I just thought everybody else would be a problem because Larry and I have gone through this about a dozen times in the last 24 hours. <laughs> okay, I, I, think, I think we're good. So, uh, okay, all right, I just wanted to check. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is this is the water characteristics, and we're seeing that the water has been stable over that period of time. We saw there's a little spike in sodium back in the late 90s for some reason, and then the bicarbonate in the water is a little bit over 200 or around 200 uh, uh, over that whole period of time. Now, if we look at the soils, this is where we want to see what the impact is going to be on the soils. Uh, there's two factors we're looking at: is uh, the we're looking at sodium percentage. I don't have the saturated paste extracts, and we can see the sodium percentage of the right graph. Does everybody have that one up? Okay, you can see it's uh, it's bouncing around. It's below six. Uh, it's around four. So those sort of guidelines that we're talking about look pretty good. And this this is a good performing, uh, what we call a good performing uh, water. And now if we're going to compare it to a location uh, not too far away. I'll let this come up, and you'll see uh, this water has an adjusted SAR. Uh, running up sometimes around 10, but it fluctuates around a little bit depending on uh, rainfall and how much water gets into the aquifer. Uh, in the in the EC graph on the right side, you can see it's been been below 0.5, so it was a problem because it wasn't salty enough for a while. And then there's some salt water intrusion. This is closer to the coast, so the water has been degrading in quality over time a little bit. Uh, sodium levels around 100 parts per million in the water, and bicarbonates we see are about 150 parts per million. So this this bicarbonate level is lower. Uh, than the bicarbonate level in the previous water. But now let's take a look at, uh, at the soils, uh, keeping in mind that the SAR is bumping up around 10. So now instead of a, a modest level of, uh, of sodium parts per million, we can see that it's uh, frequently above 500 up to 1,000 parts per million, and we're running almost always above 10% uh, sodium in the soil. So this is one of those ones where uh, we're having a problem with sodium management, but it doesn't have anything to do with bicarbonates. It's just that this water has a high proportion of sodium in it uh, relative to the other ions. So then we went back and took a look at the uh, Pace Turf water database, and in uh, a couple ways we can look at this, and we picked um, waters that were below three decimeters per meter because above three decimeters per meter on the water, we figured well, that's going to be a problem. Uh, for anybody anyway, so it's not a bicarbonate necessarily problem. It's a, it's going to take some more look at it to uh, figure out what's going on. And we found out that the from a salinity perspective, the average water is running about uh, almost one decimeter per meter. So it's uh, uh, not not bad on the average. And if we look at the adjusted sodium absorption ratio, it's down about 2.9. And 93% uh, of the water samples that we have in the database were less than six. So uh, most of the time we don't have a problem with sodium, but there is a, a, a proportion that do. And if we look at the uh, bicarbonate in the water, uh, the median is 187 parts per million. And uh, if there's a guideline, an FAO guideline, Handbook 29, which uh, which indicates that 520 parts per million above that, you're probably going to have a little something going on with bicarbonate. Your pH is probably going to be up there. You're probably going to have some carbonates in the system. So you're probably talking something above eight, but uh, Almost everybody's water is also above the uh, problem level uh, directly caused by bicarbonates. So then we also took a look at uh, the water and soil data. And uh, this will be golf courses where we have a water sample for. We have multiple uh, soil samples from uh, each location. So our, soil sam our sample size was almost 5,000 samples where we're matching up the uh, soil uh, conditions with the water conditions and looking for correlations between 
uh, any of the factors uh, that were listed here. So we're looking, does the water SAR correlate uh, with the percent soil sodium? So the top one, that's a, you get a positive correlation of 0.69, highly significant. So SAR uh, is related to increases in percent sodium. Uh, water sodium is related uh, positively, although lightly. The SAR is much more uh, important, and the salinity of the water uh, is strongly related to uh, percent sodium in the soil. And oddly enough, uh, bicarbonate uh, comes up with a negative relationship. So actually, increasing bicarbonates resulted somehow in reduced uh, uh, percent sodium, but really that that's flat. So there really was no, even though it looks like it's significant there, the slope of 0 0.002, to actually the sodium with a 0 0.008 slope is like nothing. So uh, really, uh, it looks like it was the SAR was the big player in the uh, determining percent sodium, which is what's been uh, known pretty much uh, in the past for for water and sodium. And if we look at the same sort of situation, uh, what what kind of sodium you end up in the water based on uh, uh, parts per million sodium, and we see a, a decent relationships between the water SAR uh, and the EC are the two major factors again. So it's the uh, it's the composition of those uh, salts in the water that seem to be uh, causing the the uh, the big problem, and it, uh, there's no correlation between uh, bicarbonate uh, in that situation. So these tend to to, to counter some of the uh, conventional thinking that we we hear about, I think coming out of the ag side of uh, uh, of the system, and it's a it's a little bit different uh, from from that perspective. And so I'll I'll stop with that one and let uh, uh, Mike Huck pick up and talk about some uh, other stuff. Unless there's some questions before we move on, Doug, does that sound like something that you're seeing or familiar? Or Yeah, that's um, the only the, the thing we're working on. If you go, can you go back to that slide where you show? Um, it's one of the early ones with. Uh, yeah, keep going. One more. Right there, good water guidelines. I think so. Adjusted RNA is accounts for bicarbonate. That's what the adjustment does. So okay. it looks at the bicarbonate in the water and predicts how much of the calcium will precipitate out with the bicarbonate. So my argument would be that that you don't even need to use a bicarbonate standard or an RSC. You just need that adjusted RNA. And what Glenn's working on is we think we can improve adjusted RNA by just adding soil pH. So you also said if your soil pH or if your water pH is, I forget what it is, 6.8, um, it's fine, it's no problem. I would say the soil pH matters much more than what the water pH is. Because here in Wisconsin, we can have uh, soils with pH 6.5, bicarbonate 450 parts per million, and that it's just going to, that water comes into equilibrium with the soil pH. So I, we think the soil pH is really, really important in determining what happens with that, with that SAR. And we have the computer... Um, programming and the computer models to, to make that SAR, that adjusted RNA, uh, really accurate, but um, it's just it's just not being done by the water testing labs. Yeah, we, the uh, the adjusted RNA, interestingly, Mike and I were, were run over the parameters on there where uh, uh, Mike felt that if there's a, if your adjusted RNA is three points above your standard SAR that you probably, bicarbonate might be the thing that's uh, playing a big role in there. But we went back and regressed the uh, adjusted RNAs against the uh, S SARs, and we got such a tight correlation and, all, and a slope of almost one that it was it really looked like the adjusted RNA and the SARs are not that different. So it just, it just looks right. like there's nothing happening. But yeah, yeah, I was just, I probably didn't explain that super clearly. I'm just going to try one more time. So the reason we adjust SAR or RNA is because um, if you have high bicarbonate and a high soil pH in dry conditions, uh, calcium carbonate will, will start to form in the soil, which will increase the soluble sodium. Uh, but if you have wet conditions and low pH, that's just not going to happen, even if, even if your adjusted RNA or adjusted SAR predicts that it is. So in right. certain areas of the country, specifically the upper Midwest, and I would guess Pennsylvania and into the East Coast, adjusted RNA is probably going to overestimate the SAR hazard, which tends to not be the biggest problem in the world. But 
um, like it's kind of a, it's it's a fine tuning of it, but we think it's it's an important adjustment. Well, that's where we watch for the drift of the soil pH up above eight and getting up around eight, where you're actually starting to get into the calcium carbonate problems. That's clearly uh, do we all agree on that one? I think once yeah, you start yeah. pumping above eight, yeah, yeah. that maybe maybe it's only going to be pH soil pH that we're going to talk about it in the end. I don't know. Am I ready to go? You ready? All right. We'll try and get. Oh wait, I got to share screens. What am I doing? Okay. Okay. Am I on? Do you see me? Not your screen share. No, your screen share is not on. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. Google. Google Hangout. Oh, I got. Uh, okay. There we go. Try okay. that. Yeah, we got it. Uh, okay. Should have full screen now. I'm just going to skip right into this one here. A little bit about what Doug was just talking about. The adjusted RNA is really the most recent of all the formulas that have come out of the U.S. Salinity Laboratory, which is located down here, out here at the University of California. Uh, campus. It's located on campus. It started out in the 40s when they measured the percent of sodium cations in the water and then they recognized around 1950 that bicarbonate had an issue and that's where the residual sodium carbonate formula came in. And then they recognized that those two weren't really working out and they moved toward, forward 54 to the sodium absorption ratio which is very similar to the adjusted RNA formula and I'll show you that in a moment. But and then the PHC and the saturation index came out of actually the, the plumbing industry for trying to predict corrosion versus uh, scale formation inside of pipes. And uh, I want to show you why that is really a nightmare in a golf course irrigation system. It doesn't really correlate real well based on some experience. Uh, in 68, they went to the adjusted RNA, which used the PHC that's calculated back with the saturation index to, to try and, and measure this bicarbonate influence that we finally come to 1981 with the adjusted RNA. But it, Doug, I don't know if you've ever talked to Don Suarez out at the Salini Laboratory, but he claims now the RNA is, is kind of off even. I mean, it's a predictor that you can use in the field, but you really need these fancy computer models to really get to the crux of things nowadays. So anyways, uh, hopefully you guys are seeing the next slide and it's not froze up like when Larry was coming through to me. But we, we've known for a long time, this graphic over on the left, that salinity, the increase of salinity increases infiltration rates and permeability regardless of the SAR and at a, a low salinity water like rainwater, snow melt, uh, anything that doesn't have any salt content and it's down here and no sodium content really impacts uh, infiltration rates. Now this is often said to be more dramatic in the west where you have less well developed soils, less organic matter, more expansive uh, Montmerlinite type and uh, forget the other ones, uh, the expansive clays that shrink and swell clays. And so we see this in the Sierra region, Sacramento, the Central Valley where their, their water sources are coming straight out of the uh, Sierra mountains with snow melt and it's very low salinity. I've seen water sources with you know 70 parts per million and SAR of 0.1 but yet they won't penetrate the ground. Uh, you know they they fall down here in the lower left hand corner of this chart. Now the adjusted RNA formula is just like the SAR formula with the exception of this this substituted calcium value which I'm going to show you the chart of next and, and my point is here that this is also determined by salinity factors. So if we go to the, the lookup table that's published in FAO 29 water quality for agriculture which is if, if you Google search water quality for agriculture you will hit this publication online you can uh, look at it online print it download it whatever you want to do but this is where you take the ratio of your bicarbonate to calcium and for my example I just use six mill equivalents of bicarbonate and so I just have to be done mill equivalents 
to 4 mil equivalents of calcium. That gives me a ratio of 1.5. And if I had an electrical conductivity of 1, it would put us right out here in the middle of the chart. And we would plug in a 1.58 mil equivalents for calcium instead of the 4 because that's reducing that amount of soluble calcium that's available based on that bicarbonate to calcium ratio. Well, if you look at this chart more closely, you notice that if you continue to cross and went over here to where you have a much higher EC, that calcium number goes up. If you go over on this end where your, where your uh, salinity levels are lower, that calcium goes down. So this is all interrelated as far as more salt, better water penetration. More difficulty to manage plants, but better water penetration in soil because you have two distinct things you're always dealing with, and that's the salt accumulation from the plant tolerance aspect versus the soil structural uh, component. As Larry already mentioned, it's the lightweight waters where I have observed most bicarbonate problems to manifest themselves here in the southwest, or at least in California. I, I've heard rumors of down in Florida where they have a lot of problems like this, but they also have low salinity waters in some of these cases and that's where the bicarbonate dominates the total anions you've got to split your cations from your anions if your water test doesn't do that for you if they're about 50 percent or more then you really need to start looking more closely at this and there's two ways to address this uh, you can add more salts to the water be it uh, you know gypsum uh, is always one use here there are you can use uh, certain fertilizers and fertigation you can you know uh, your urea sulfuric acid actually increases the salinity of the water as well as addressing the bicarbonates you want to use divalent cations whenever possible uh, so that would be urea um, calcium nitrate things like that calcium source you stay away from monovalent cations where you've got like ammonium sulfate if you put that in there it'll react more like uh, a sodium ion in there than it will if you put a divalent cation in there. Um, the other thing that with these ultralight waters is look for a minimum standard of at least 20 parts per million or one mil equivalent of calcium in that water. I see a lot of those snow melt sources that have you know like seven parts per million calcium and, and they just don't penetrate the ground that way and I think a lot of this uh, is a combination of things. It's a low salinity that bicarbonate over 50% uh, locking up what little calcium is in there already and you get these problems with water penetration plus we have the expansive soils that are more sensitive to all these things okay the thing I really wanted to hit on is irrigation system impacts because this is one when you get it boy you want to fix it and there's a number of different ways of looking at these things and I have tried to research every one I can find and the ones I find are you know, the drip irrigation industry says look at total alkalinity, total hardness. They give you these numbers, 150, 200 parts per million. If your pH gets greater than 7.5, well, you got to be careful because they even state that these numbers will change from the time you take a water sample and send it to the laboratory. So they recommend getting um, going down to a pool supply store and getting the hardness and alkalinity testing kits and test your water right on site because there's less chance that you'll get erroneous numbers there. The saturation index is one that's brought up in water quality for agriculture where that is your actual pH value and then you subtract the calculated pH value, that PHC that I mentioned earlier, which PHC was a value that assumes saturation with uh, calcium carbonate in the water before it precipitates out, I think it is. And you subtract it from there, a positive number precipitates, a negative number is supposed to dissolve. The chart over here on the right with the values, the uh, minus 1.5 up to plus 1.5, that came out of a, a publication talking about piping industry, uh, you know, plumbing type uh, values, where they were actually trying to get just a small amount of calcium carbonate on the inside of metal pipes back in the old days because it, it kind of... Uh, provided a sealant on the inside of the pipe to keep it from corroding. Another one I ran into was the Bayless curve, and I'll show you that in a minute. But the thing that's really so hard to predict on any of these things and when you start to see precipitation in irrigation systems is as temperature, you know, there's temperature comes into uh, play, pressure, and turbulence. And as temperature increases, calcium is one of those strange elements that it precipitates out. You think of 
you know, you boil milk and it curdles. Um, in, and CO2 is released in a lake as it warms up. And that I'll show you why that affects things in a moment. And as pressure drops, uh, CO2 is released out of the water, and the CO2 creates a, a temporary acidic condition in groundwater, carbonic acid, kind of like a soda pop. Crack it open, it goes flat. Same things happen when you take the, and this is western groundwater. I don't know about Midwest and eastern groundwater, but in the west, we have this carbonic acid component that keeps the pH down when it first comes out of the ground, and then it, it sometimes rises. Uh, turbulence in valves and change of direction fittings can cause the CO2 to separate and convert to bicarbonate on the fly, basically, as it's traveling through. And these dr dramatic pressure drops through the swing joint of the sprinkler at the base of the sprinkler and out the nozzle, all in that confined area, also can drive this precipitation to occur. This is the Bayless curve. It's nice and simple. You plot your pH to your alkalinity, and it kind of tells you if you're scaling or not. And, and I'm going to go through this a little bit quick. Anybody wants any of this information, I'm glad to email me and I'll send you the slides. This was a, in an article on drip irrigation that I found about five stages of CO2 transformation. Uh, you've got CO2 dissolved in the water. I want you to think of this as your soda pop again. The solubility reduces as the temperature increases. Water under pressure holds more CO2. Aeration scrubs CO2 from the water. So you put it in a lake from the groundwater, everything starts changing. Your CO2 initially combines with water molecule and creates a carbonic acid. That carbonic acid loses a proton, the first of two, and it becomes bicarbonate. As the pH goes up, it loses a second one, it becomes carbonate. And once you get that carbonate in there, you're at about a pH of 7.8 to 8, and it's right around 8 where the precipitation in a sprinkler system just goes crazy. It uh, can become really bad. The other times you'll get the precipitation are from evaporation, like Doug talked about in the drier climates. And like Larry was saying, I think we see more of that in agricultural soils where the surface dries out completely compared to a turf system where you're going into the thatch. That's thatch is somewhat like a wet sponge and holds a little more moisture. It's got the canopy kind of shielding it from drying out quite so quickly. And then, you know, the thatch is going to be potentially acidic and maybe keep that in solution when it's wetted again. I don't know. Uh, we don't really see evidence of that all too often. Uh, so, you know, this, this evaporation can also happen at these points where the pressure drops, like at a drip emitter or a sprinkler nozzle. Uh, when I was with the USGA years ago, I remember visiting golf courses over in Arizona where you'd see drops of calcium carbonate that had just attached themselves to the outside edge of sprinkler nozzles because uh, as that pressure release was going on there and a few drops would cling around there, it would evaporate off. Um, the other thing is the algae and pond weeds. You've got a, a day to night fluctuation of pH going on in a lake because the algae is releasing. CO2 and consuming CO2 depending on whether it's respirating at night or photosynthesizing during the day. And you can actually have the calcite precipitate out of your lake before it even gets into your irrigation system to some extent. You'll see the sodium absorption ratio go up because that calcium is no longer in solution in the water. So uh, where you take your water samples at becomes a critical thing in trying to diagnose some of these things too. Uh, pond aeration removes some of the CO2 from the water because it scrubs it out. This is just a quick chart. You look at the saturation index, remember positive precipitates, negative dissolves lime. I've got a mix of both. Here's the predicted risk, little or moderate. Look at these pHs, eight, almost 9, 9.6. It says, you know, a little bit of scale from the Bayless curve, moderate precipitation here. Well, here's what was really happening in the sprinkler over on the left-hand side. They were getting tremendous amount of precipitation at that site. This is down in Texas on the left. This one over here on the right is a recycled water site. It's a cemetery in, in uh, Riverside, California area. Um, and they're getting all this calcium carbonate buildup on the, on the, at the screens and sprinklers. And, you know, initially I always thought it was just breaking off the pipeline walls and migrating down here. But now I'm starting to believe that perhaps it's accumulating there because of the small passageways 
uh, the, the friction coefficients, the pressure drop that occurs due to the friction coefficients, plus that water may heat up at those points a little bit from the friction and just, you know, tip you over the top, put you over the curve. Uh, this picture of a bicarbonate crust on kind of a, a granular soil or sand, uh, this is from southeastern Utah, the uh, St. George area. Uh, I stole this one out of the files at the USGA years ago. I apologize for being kind of out of focus. It's a bad scan of an ectochrome slide or a kodachrome slide. Um, there's some other things you got to be careful of if you're if people are considering fertigation because if you've got some bicarbonates in the water already and you add phosphorus or you add more calcium or or you add uh, aqua ammonia or something that that increases pH, you can trigger these precipitation problems in the sprinkler lines. So any of this that you're going to Consider if you know you've already got some moderately high bicarbonates over, say, uh, you know, 150, 200 parts per million. That's kind of a threshold where you start to see some of these things kick it into high gear. You probably want to jar test this and make sure you aren't going to create more problems before you, you know, start fertigating. If you do have some scale buildup, it's not always bicarbonate. Uh, I've worked with what they call gypsiferous soils and waters, which have high sulfates in them, and they precipitate gypsum instead of lime. Well, this photo is, just, is some lime. You can see I acid, drop some acid on it, and you get a violent reaction. On my Google Plus page, if you can get to me, I posted a video this morning of what you can expect for that reaction by dripping some acid onto the bicarbonate. You can see it happen. It was a golf course up in Wyoming where they actually have two aquifers, one that's high in bicarbonate and low in calcium and moderate sodium makes the SAR extremely high and the adjusted RNA very high. Uh, their second aquifer, a deeper or shallower one, is high in calcium, low in sodium. You blend the two of them together, it's good, but they were using more of one than the other and they were starting to get the uh, precipitants breaking off and, and accumulating up at their sprinkler screens. If you do acid treat, I'm also going to suggest that you uh, get a titration done at a laboratory. There are a number of different products out there nowadays with these synthetic versus conventional acids, and, and some are better than others, some are stronger than others. And uh, Brian Whitlark, if you want to research this, wrote a great article on acid substitutes and pH reduction, and I basically stole these tables right out of there from his data. Um, but it shows you the different rates, the gallons per acre foot, which is 326,000 gallons of water, gallons of acid needed to lower the pH of that water source to 6.5. And you can see that this is a very weak acid down here. Product C needed 1,300 gallons, over 1,300 gallons to do it. And that correlates back to cost and the cost of the product per gallon. And when you extrapolate these out using, you know, good old sulfuric acid, uh, that they use a lot of in Arizona at 51, you know, 51 dollars per acre foot treated, or 21 dollars in this case, or 23 over here is a whole lot less than using one of these weak acids that they're charging 50 dollars a gallon for. So, and these are titration evaluations from a lab. Uh, this one on the left is a recycled water source, and on the right is the same course as potable water source you can see that they extend out differently and that the rate to get the pH to 6.5 is 49 gallons per acre roughly for the recycled water and 28 gallons per acre for the potable water. Why the difference? Different salinity levels, different bicarbonate uh, concentrations. So uh, best thing to do, I mean, you can, you can calculate some of these out if you're a good chemist. I'm not a good enough chemist. For you know, 70 bucks or something, you can send a sample to the lab and get the real, real value. You know, we're we're talking about before. We hear a lot of stuff about uh, precipitation in sand root zones, maybe down at the uh, uh, interface between the sand and the gravel. I have seen some of this visually show up. Uh, again, it was with the lightweight waters up in uh, the central part of California. It was actually a sodium bicarbonate that an old uh, farm agronomist that was a member at a golf club up there pointed out to me at the first time when I wasn't familiar with it. 
years ago. He said it was a, it was a sodium bicarbonate crust, and it, it looked like a layer of clay in there. It looked like somebody put a clay-based sod in the middle of the green and then top dressed over top of it. Uh, and when you broke it up, it was, you know, gummy and gooey and, and all that. And he said they find it very often in the uh, natural sandy loam soils up in that area. But there is the potential for some of this. I think, again, as Larry pointed out, I think it's probably of higher risk in a bare soil environment, row crop environment, things like that. Uh, but if you do see things like that, deep flushing can be beneficial. And uh, I've seen this with uh, mountain golf courses out in Colorado, which again have that snow melt water with low salinity, low calcium, low and probably high bicarbonates again, going from memory, that if they flush their greens and deep watered them, they got a better response and, and kept that little bit of interface uh, from from building up down there at the base. Because there's organic and stuff that flushes down there too. Uh, I've taken apart old greens down at that interface and, you know, it's like all stuck together and clotted there. So I'm just going to finish up and say, you know, sand is more affected due to less surface area than a clay. When you think of sand, think of a box that the playing cards would come in. When you think of clay, think of the 52 cards being the individual clay platelets that stick together to create a, sod, a clod, and you've got to coat all those 52 cards front and back with calcium carbonate versus putting that same amount of calcium carbonate on a, on the box, you're going to get a thicker layer building up on the box. Eventually, you're going to seal pores and sand a little bit more rapidly if you've got a significant problem than you are with a clay. Uh, the calcium sulfate as opposed to calcium carbonate precipitation. If your water is dominated by sulfate, you know, what you see precipitating may not necessarily be lime. It may be, sul it may be gypsum. Uh, and acidifying fertilizer, don't discount the value of your acidifying fertilizers as to how much of this lime, if you do have some calcium carbonate building up, that it'll break down. If we look here, ammonium sulfate, one pound of nitrogen ammonium sulfate will break down 524 pounds of calcium carbonate. Or if you look at it from a pound for pound, 100 pounds of ammonium sulfate applied breaks down 110 pounds of calcium carbonate. So, you know, there, there's a, a, uh, a huge value in, in the nitrogen you're putting down as to addressing some of this problem. And the question is, do you really need to go beyond that and acidify the water? And most of the times, as Larry and I feel, unless you're getting precipitation in the pipelines like I showed you, there's really not a, a big driving point in most cases uh, that we've been able to see, at least in our neck of the woods, to uh, treat these waters other than maybe in some of these cases with some of the low, uh, low salinity waters that it may show up a little bit more, uh, a little bit more distinctly. Uh, some resources for you. Uh, you know, water quality for agriculture is online. This management of gypsiferous soils, if you're interested in that. I run into gypsiferous soils in Wyoming, Colorado, and uh, uh, New Mexico myself. Uh, they're probably out there in other parts of the country too. And then if, if you want to know more about these, you know, what fertilizers you can mix and what rates and that these fertigation references have a lot of mixing tables and things like that that will keep you out of trouble there. And then one other article that uh, maybe is a little bit over the top, I'm one of the co-authors on treating cause not to symptoms, discusses uh, bicarbonate problems and specifically that we published in the USJ Green section back in 1999 with Ronnie Duncan and Bob Carroll. But I, I think that uh, based on more observation, we may stress the cause a little bit more than uh, stress the problem a little bit more than actually exists, at least again in our neck of the woods. There could be localized problem areas uh, throughout the country, but uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't know for sure if there really is a problem. I'm, I'm in the same camp as Larry and Micah. It's not a really a, as big a problem as we make it. So how do I get off a screensaver now, John? You're off. OK. Comments uh, from anybody? I mean, all this stuff that's like, like, I'm like waiting for the bottom line. So what does it mean to uh, the people that would be watching out here? And if you're muted, just unmute yourself. Can I? Can I uh, just jump in, John, and, uh, and put an example up, and then and uh, Soldat can talk about this also, and uh, see if it it makes sense looking at the pH 
side of the equation rather than most of the other stuff. Sure. Oh, wait a minute. This is not the right one. Maybe I'll do you that. Know what I noticed we were doing, Larry, is we're, we're talking about a lot of things other than bicarbonate. So, and I think what Doug would say also would be that uh, we don't really need to concern ourselves about bicarbonate so much because we can solve the water quality issues by looking at, at other factors. Right. Well, let, let me let me just put in. Uh, yeah, I think that's correct. Also, so I'm I'm, I'm agreeing with you. But there's a. I'll show you the one sample where I thought maybe uh, bicarbonate might be playing a role. Let me just go up here. And, uh, but this case, like you're saying, it is so. It's a sodium pH issue. Uh, but you know, we're seeing the. Uh, you know the adjusted RNA, which is the correct way to look at it, not the the old adjusted SAR. So it's not up at the six guideline that we were looking at. So I I hadn't considered treating this water uh, particularly as yet. Uh, and we'll see that the uh, you know bicarbonates are uh, you know they're they're modest, not not huge levels. They're not they're not 50 percent of the anions. So it's not hitting hitting a lot of the uh, typical issues that we would look for but in this particular case um, I finally after like eight or nine years watched the pH go up let me drop this down in size just a little bit so this is what this is how it was trending recycle water it was starting out pretty high this is fairways so the pH is going up and going up so I was just watching this trend and uh, back in here uh, the superintendent installed an acid injection system dropped the pH down to fast which was surprising down to about 72. I about had a heart attack uh, with this drop, so it might have been buffering a little too low. Then they shut it off after that, and you can see the pH returned uh, pretty pretty rapidly after that uh, that period of time. But it seems like this this is one of those cases where you're getting that if you're seeing a trend, you know, especially if you're starting down here and you're seeing a trend up and you're starting to get up above eight, you're going to start seeing some uh, calcite formation. In the system, and that's where the acid injection can help out. Does that? Does everybody agree on that or not? Yeah. Yeah, Larry. This I think we're at, we're actually exactly on the same page. Um, what what we're saying is that that the adjusted RNA doesn't account for is soil pH. But it, um, Mike mentioned the Suarez thing. If you that Suarez paper that that basically came up with adjusted RNA says in it 1981. It's like you know this this method is okay but it would be really nice if we just had a computer that could just calculate all this stuff for us and that's 1981 right so we got we can do this on our iPhones now it's just nobody has taken the time to to build that database and make the right calculation so in that case that's exactly that's a perfect example of why we need to improve that adjusted RNA to account for soil pH because then it's you know your adjusted RNA is going to be like 17 it's not going to be 5 uh, so, it's right. Doug, you, uh, they may actually have done that. They've got a very sophisticated program that I got a copy of, and I, yeah. I was like banging my head against the wall trying Mintech. to figure it out. It's, What's that? It's called Mintech, or there's there's a couple of them. But yeah, they're, they're 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 basically water chemistry simulation software. That and that's kind of what Glenn's doing is taking the software and just plugging in the numbers and get it and showing how they change when the soil pH moves. Yeah. So we think you know this is a problem that's that's solved by technology and the issue we're having is just getting it out there and getting it adapted. Um, well, the other, the other thing, I mean, but, but now at least we have like soil pH we can go on and as a, as a bit of a guide. If you yeah. get this trend, you're trending up like this and it's sort of like, you know, okay, there's a point where you got to just go, okay, nothing we're doing is, is turning this around. The nitrogen's not doing it. We can't, we just can't turn it around. So just start injecting and Larry, what kind of soil was that? Was that a sand, a loam, a clay, or it's a it's see? a loam. It's a loam. Sandy, yeah, sandy loam. But it's been top. They've also been uh, top dressing it pretty heavily too well, to try to. That's improve. the other thing is you get into a lighter soil, you're going to see those trends happen a lot more rapidly than you are in our typical junk clays that we've got out here in the southwest. So if you're in a loamy soil or a sandy soil, I, I see all this stuff happen at the speed of light compared to what you see in a clay. You know. Oh. And the other thing that I'm interested in is this not not so much. I've been looking mainly at the uh, regular soils rather than the sand-based stuff for a lot of this stuff because the sand-based stuff we can push around and a little bit of uh, calcite in there is not going to be a problem. You know, manage the pH. Uh, but you know, the uh, CO2 impacts on 
uh, bicarbonates in the root zone, you know, are, have got to be huge because we've measured two, two and a half, three percent CO2 in root zones, uh, and that's that's going to be an interesting one to model. I don't know if there's more bicarbonate due to microbial activity than there is in the water that we're putting on. So it's sort of like it really doesn't matter what's in the water; it's what's going to happen in the system. Well, and, and to add to that, Larry, if I remember correctly, I, either Don Suarez mentioned this in a talk I heard him give or it's in one of his papers, that the adjusted RNA and the adjusted SAR, or at least the adjusted RNA, they really developed it more so to use on the tailwater down the Imperial Valley because they were leaching out so much more bicarbonate. And then when they reused it as irrigation water, it was making it worse and worse and worse, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But And then they also found that it's useful for the groundwater because of the... Uh, uh, the carbonic acid in there, and once that gas is off, you've you've got an increased uh, increased pH and increased hazard there. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about the uh, precipitation on the surface in the algae. So Mike was talking about um, how photosynthesis increases alkalinity, which increases the chance of bicarbonate precipitating out. And so in Wisconsin, you know, we, we hear that bicarbonate's a problem all the time. And when we look at the science, it's like, no, it's not really a problem. Uh, but then when we kill grass, you go out and we notice a uh, white crust on the surface. So it doesn't surprise me at all that golf course superintendents have drawn the conclusion that this high bicarbonate is causing this crust where the right. dead grass goes on. But we've every time we see it, it's associated with algae. So we think it's just a side effect of the you know the conditions that allowed the algae to come in is what killed the grass. The fact that you're irrigating with high bicarbonate water puts a white crust on top of that that algal mat. So right. it's sort of like uh, it's it's correlation but not causation so um, right. it's, yeah so it sounds like maybe you guys have seen that too oh yeah, yeah well, I think, well go ahead Larry well if you can't any place that the water doesn't move through the soil and you're in your irrigating uh, you're gonna get some you're gonna kill the grass and kill the grass then it doesn't you know who cares at, at that point you know it's <laughs> something wrong with the system but but I, I agree with I agree with Doug that you'll see, well, in our case, sometimes it's just salts. It may not be necessarily just bicarbonate, but we just see a white salt crust accumulate in those areas, too, where you, where you can't move the water through. And uh, that can be a, a sodic soil, you know, in a, in a field, or it can be that algae mat on a green. It doesn't matter. The water sits there, it evaporates, and that whatever it is, salt or bicarbonate, sodium gypsum, whatever, it's left behind. Well, here, here's another one that... Uh... That, that came up. It was a, a superintendent uh, thinking he had a, a, a problem with bicarbonate in his water, which he does have a bit of a bicarbonate in his water, but this is an NRCS soil survey of the golf course, and his, all the soils, um, well, 47% of the soils hydric, you know, and it, so it rains there and the water doesn't go anywhere, you know, and he's, he's thinking about treating the, treating the irrigation water when really what needs to be done is they need to sand cap it and put some drainage in because there's just no way you're going to get those soils like that to to perform. So the issues are complex. I think that's what what the uh, what the problem is, and and it tends to uh, get more complicated uh, if we get too uh, hung up on the uh, on just a single factor like bicarbonate. It's certainly a simple yes. one to pick out. Any of the superintendents out there have any comments on this? Is it making any sense? Matt, what are you thinking? Well, I, as I stated before, my bicarbonates are not that big of an issue. Um, even on the uh, the worst soil sample that I've, uh, water sample, excuse me, that I've had um, in a different hangout, I, I referred to your um, your critique of my water as the uh, sucks, super sucks, and mega sucks, and it was a mega sucks water. The um, salt concentration was almost 3,000 parts per million, but the bicarbonates were only 28. I'm looking at the uh, sample right here. So, yeah, it's above your six, but it's not a crazy number. It's it's mostly sodium that I'm fighting, not bicarbonates. So. Basically, this last hour has just given me a headache, just like the Duncan and Caro talk on uh, 
uh, you know, soil affected, uh, salt affected soils and so forth. There's too much math for me, Larry. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, you just got to remember, according to Doug, uh, you just need to remember the pH number and you're, you're done. Oh, he needs a number. Eight? Is that the number, Doug? <laughs> you just need yeah, my, my pH is 6.5. Uh, I think my town water is 7. My well water is generally 6s. Uh, so, you know, I never get up to the 7s and 8s. Thank God, I guess. Doug, did you have something? Uh, you're muted. You're muted in case you did have something. But um, <laughs> so if you take it down to the superintendent level, and Bill's in here, and you know he was a superintendent, and said he had bicarbonate issues. Bill, from your perspective, what did you guys? What what did you do, or what would you advise to do by outsiders? Like, um, do you think what anything that you put into place worked, or do you think now after listening to this that maybe it's not a big issue? I, I just I'm still trying to grasp the. End result. Well, we, uh, it, it was when I was at a golf, I don't want to name the golf course, but it, it was not heartfelt. Um, and it, they were California style greens. And in the, in the midst of summer, you know, we would just notice when we would go for long periods without rain. I mean, 45, 50, 55 days, something like that. You know, the, the greens, the bent on the greens would get a yellowish tinge no matter what you were putting down. You would try, you know, um, Calcium drenches, I won't name any products. Um, you would just run irrigation, run irrigation. It seemed like the more you did that and the more you tried to fight that, the worse it got. And really the only thing we found, um, and again, all this talk was intriguing, but sometimes budget issues don't allow you to really dig in as much as you want, is we would just wait for rain. You know, we would get a good rain, a good downpour, a good thunderstorm, and uh, it was gone. Everything greened up and we were good. But you get it, we would get into that, I would say 40 days of no rain and constant irrigation, and we would start seeing that. And then you would start seeing a little bit of the white crust, but it was more of the, the reaction of the turf and the color of the turf, the turgor of the turf that we would see. And we knew we had water issues, but we just couldn't do a whole lot with it. Mike? You know, I've heard similar stories before, and I... I it could be a salinity plus, you know, bicarbonate issue. It could be a sodium issue. It's really hard to say without looking at the water sample, looking at some soil samples. And, and you really have to look at them all as an entire encompassing thing. You can't just look at one and say that's your problem or look at the right. other. I, I think you got to look at and, and you brought up, uh, somebody brought up a good point there about the, your soil. You know, you can acid drip some soil samples. You can dry them in a microwave oven in a couple of minutes time, pull a three-quarter inch core out with your tube, and drop acid on them, see if you're accumulating bicarbonates in the soil. That'll at least tell you if you get a violent fizz or just a little bit of fizz. A little bit of fizz is probably not a big problem, but if you get a real violent reaction, uh, maybe you need to, you know, start looking a little closer at some of these stuff, uh, some of these things. Well, one, one other thing I'll mention is that the... Uh, that uh, Bob mentioned flushing in the the flushing volumes it's really you need about six inches of water to to run through the profile to drop the salts by about fifty percent so that's like twenty thousand gallons for a five thousand square foot green that water's got to go through the system and those numbers are pretty that's pretty reasonable number so it's it's pretty easy to get salts to accumulate but the magnitude of flushing uh, that people need to do is probably not as high as they they're probably not putting on as much as uh, as as you as you'd like to yeah. you need to see the water really coming out of the drains to keep it flushing and that'll keep that uh, I think and, and Doug I don't know about about you every once in a while people are complaining about carbonates right at the interface between the uh, gravel and the sand uh, where it's anaerobic all the time if, and especially if you don't if you don't flush those areas through and keep uh, Keep those uh, calcite. If there is any calcite building up in solution, move them out of there. Yeah. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost them. Yeah, God, it's, it was a. I, I agree with John. It was a. It was a tough topic to kind of digest. I know Matt. You said you're kind of on board. Um, I was trying to tweet out and get some engagement and some questions going from other superintendents but uh, it's a it's a tough topic to swallow but I would say um, that's why we have you guys <laughs> you know if people are seeing issues they should be reaching out because we don't well 
this is one of the things, I mean, it, unless you've dealt with these problems or you deal with these problems regularly, they're really foreign and it, they're hard to grasp. And when Dr. Duncan and I do the water quality seminar at GCSA, I always try and remember to say, there's two types of people in here. They're the ones that the light's going to go on and they go, now I understand what's going on in my system. And there's the other ones that go, what the hell am I doing here because I don't have this problem. I'm wasted a day, you know. And so that's just kind of the way it works. So you guys that are dealing, you guys that are dealing with this and, and helping turf managers, um, Mike, you had mentioned you need to look at it holistically. What? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on? So if somebody sends you a water sample, but that's just the water we're looking at. Uh, if they send you a soil sample, that's just a soil. So if somebody wants to say, "Hey, I'm having issues. I think this is what it is." How do you, any of you, anticipate? Or would suggest well, people it, first family. it depends on what the problem is. Is it a sodium problem, a salt problem, or a, a bicarbonate problem, or you know, or they are perceived by bicarbonate problem. You know, and they send me a water sample, I'll say, Can you send me some soil samples? I need to look at that. I need to see what the SAR is doing in the soil. I need to see what, you know, your exchangeable sodium percentage is, whatever's whoever they're doing their lab testing with, depending on whether they're doing doing paste extracts or they're doing, you know, just nutrient analysis with extractants and, and you gotta you gotta have both you gotta you gotta look at both I think Larry would agree you can't just look yeah, at one and make a final determination yeah I agree you don't need and you shouldn't look at it at just one time point either and it's in particular like right. you said Bob you had periods where you had drought and and irrigation you want to you want to catch it uh, after rainfall periods yeah it's very seasonal for us out here so we have all our rainfall in the winter, and then we have like four to six months of uh, no rainfall. It's 100% irrigation, so we we catch it uh, the setup going into the summer, uh, and then see what kind of damage was done by irrigation after the end of the summer. And then you track that from year to year, like that, uh, like the graph I showed you to look for trends, because trends are way more important than a single uh, soil test. So it's kind of hard to go from a single soil test. I always like to see a few years to you know is it is it going in the wrong direction? I mean, and it looks like uh, that we're we're talking about watching your soil pH, and, and really, not you don't have to be that concerned until you get something up around eight, you know, high sevens, seven, eight, eight. Then you start to figure out, well, has that been going up? And if it's been going up, well, what do we, what can we do about it? I mean, using acidulating fertilizer or some other method to manage it. Going, going back to Bob's question from earlier, is or your description of your greens where they would yellow when you went through a drought period. Did you see the, uh, typically you ever see the aerification holes stay green and the areas surrounding them just yellow? You know, not in, in wetter areas, but that would make sense because it's getting more oxygen, but not in the drier areas. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that helps. Because that, that's a typical indicator of salt that will leach down through the fresh wheat, top dress sand, where they're not leaching as effectively through the organic you know your 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 mat layer and that's one of the first things we would see out here in the west is when you get a little bit of salt build up if you're not addressing it the urification holes look nice and green and lush and healthy a lot of cases and the turf around them is struggling and you know brown and yellow and and whatever uh, so the, uh, sometimes that can be a tip that you just need more water yeah I, I definitely do see that occasionally when I aerify and um, my biggest issue is that my water is not consistent. The more I water, the saltier it gets. And um, trends are an interesting fact, as Larry said, but how do you compare year to year when your rainfall changes year to year? So um, that's the biggest uh, headache that I fight is consistency. Um, we sample constantly. In fact, my vendor is going to show up any minute now. We're going to go out and pull some soil samples. I haven't taken a water sample this year yet because I haven't really used it much. I've had plenty of rain, but we will probably do a water sample today as a baseline for the season, and it'll be great. Come July when I'm watering seven days a week, uh, you know, and we don't get rain for two or three weeks, that's when I spike up. So. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to uh, Larry. It looks like you might want to show a slide, but I want to wrap it up because we're over just over an hour. I just put that up for the polka dots. It's, we're done. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay. I, 
I think what I'd like to do, this is a lot of information to, to take in, and I'm actually going to go back and watch this again and try and concentrate on, like, the slides that you were going through. I think that's probably going to be necessary for a dope like me. Um, and I think that there may be opportunities within this Hangout to kind of revisit this issue and then talk about it. Okay, this, we presented the science part of it. I think Doug and Larry and Mike, uh, everybody gave good information. Uh, but maybe next time t we'll talk about, okay, what does it mean? And give maybe some case studies of specific courses and how they've solved their issues or what people can do when they're told that they have bicarbonate issues, but then we're telling them they don't. Um, I think I, it's a good potential topic for a future um, hangout. And so I'm going to leave it at that, but what I want to do is, as always, go around the room, give everybody the opportunity to um, give their final comments. Please keep it to a, a short uh, bit. Um, I've got a meeting to get to shortly here. And um, promote whatever you want. Anything that you got going on or coming up, as always, we're uh, we're wide open to that. So we'll start with you, Bill, and um, uh, and we'll go left to right. Whenever he, the person's done, just chime in, whoever's next to him. So, guys, great conversation today. I guess uh, my take-home point is to uh, guys out there having issues is reach out. Reach out to the professionals. I would agree with John. Let's rewatch this. Maybe uh, pick some specifics and talk on that. But I guess uh, take-home point is reach out, reach out to the professionals that kind of deal with this all day and uh, certainly take a holistic approach. So great, great hangout today. You don't want to promote Turf Republic? I did at the beginning. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> You're muted, Doug. You're still muted. <laughs> you got no sound? All right, Doug uh, doesn't have any sound. Sorry, I don't know what happened. But, uh, we'll, we'll say, uh, Doug, great job. Thanks for uh, participating, and we'll uh, catch up with you next time, too. And then, uh, okay, next. I enjoyed the conversation today. Uh, look forward to learning more about it in the future. Uh, if you want to learn more about our program, you can follow us on Twitter at TTU Turf, or you can follow our blog at TTU Turf as well. So, thanks. Josh? It was a uh, great chat, and uh, I'd like to plug our uh, Aquatrol's Guide to Assessing and Managing Soil and Water Quality Issues. Uh, a lot of what you guys talked about today was is in our guide and uh, it'll be useful maybe in uh, some further editions and uh, you can find it on our website and or on our Twitter account. Which is Aquatrolls at Aquatrolls on Aquatrolls.com, right? Yep. Alright, Larry. Okay, this is Larry Stoll from PaceTurf at uh, www.paceturf.org or uh, on Facebook under PaceTurf or, or YouTube, any of those. Thanks a lot for sponsoring this, John. Okay. Matt? Uh, Matt Crowther, Mink Meadows again. I will just uh, reiterate what Bill said and say, you know, test, 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 sample, sample, sample. I mean, you just can never have enough data to um, use to your own benefit. So, soil sample, uh, water sample. You don't have to sample the whole golf course, just spot treat and spot treat often. All right. Um, I'm, it's almost bedtime here in Bangkok, so I'm not going to drag this on any longer. But I, I just want to say one thing. I think the reason why we have a hard time uh, saying what it's all about is because it's not really a problem, so it's hard for anyone to actually articulate that. Uh, I think this gets made way too complicated. I think it should be more simple, but uh, we can talk about that another time. Thank you very much for sitting through that. I'm going to agree with Micah and uh, just sign off. I've, I've got to get to Morro Bay tomorrow for a uh, interview with the city on a water recycling project. So that's what I'm going to be up to from here on out. Thanks, John, for putting it together. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys for uh, participating. Um, I will plug my app, TurfPath. Uh, T-U-R-F-P-A-T-H, you can find it on Twitter. Um, it got launched last week, and uh, it's going well. So if you're interested in any sort of information on turf pests, then uh, you can download that app for free on Google and iPhone. So um, with that, I want to thank everybody, especially those that brought a lot of information and good ideas and information to the, uh, to the turf chat. We plan on having a few more in the next few weeks, and we'll be launching kind of a calendar, I think, pretty soon, so we have some um, good information. Uh, with that, I'm going to sign off. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. All right.